Hello, I'm Susanna Playstead, Architect Evangelist at Salesforce, and today I'm going to share 10 things you should avoid doing on Salesforce. So let's get into it. Number 10, don't underestimate the overhead that it takes to manage form factors. It's incredibly difficult. So instead, you should use standard lightning page templates whenever it's possible. If you have to expose those custom components in the app builder, make sure that you're declaring supported form factors in their respective design files and that you're implementing with aware styling patterns. Number nine, don't build an automation without truly understanding what context, so system or user context, that it will run in. Ignoring this detail can result in a number of different issues, including but not limited to a loss of data integrity. So remember that different automation tools are going to run or maybe not run in different contexts. For example, Apex will run in system context by default. And as of spring 23, you can now specify user mode for database operations. So I'll put a link to that down below. Now, Flow, on the other hand, has no single default behavior. A flow is going to run in user or system context based on how that flow was launched. But you do have the option to enforce sharing in system context. Process builders, oh my goodness, process builders, we know we should not be using them for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is that they are going to run in system context without sharing considerations. So yeah, definitely avoid this. Number eight, don't assume that all operations can be rolled back. Synchronous callouts or actions that access external data aren't included in any platform rollback behaviors. So what you want to do instead is take advantage of platform rollback behaviors when you're working with external data by using either async apex methods, asynchronous paths, or invocable actions. Number seven, don't only consider short-term savings. So do evaluate long-term app maintenance savings against those recurring costs of subscription-based apps, especially if you are in a scenario where you have to pay recurring costs for a lot of business functionality that your users are not gonna actually use. Number six, don't assume that a small change is harmless. So you need to remember that no customizations are trivial, period. Over time, every change, no matter how small, has consequences. At the end of the day, if you do need to implement that custom solution, you can mitigate the inevitable technical debt your system is going to accrue by choosing a low code technology whenever it's possible. And of course, by creating composable units in your solution so you can swap things in and out if needed. Number five. Don't assume that private org-wide defaults are the optimal approach in every internal sharing use case. Now, hear me out. You do, of course, want to evaluate the sensitivity of the data and adjust your OWDs accordingly, but if private is not truly justified by the business need, use public read-only. Remember that CRUD permissions and field-level security are actually not controlled by OWDs at all. Number four. Don't overlook API access control. Did you know that anyone with a valid set of credentials can connect any app to your org, even if that connected app isn't pre-configured or even installed in your organization? Enable API access control to lock down all connected apps access to your org Salesforce APIs, and then approve or allow list specific connected apps. Grant approved users for specific apps using permission sets. Number three, don't underestimate the risks inherent to portable devices. That means your phones. So if a mobile device is stolen and its wireless connection is disabled, OAuth tokens can't be revoked. So you're gonna wanna enable passcode lock protection on your mobile connected app to require a pin or passcode unlock after inactivity. Number two, don't skimp on security for API-based logins. So no more shared integration users. Create a unique user for each integrated system so that you can adhere to the principle of least privilege and 
you're in luck because you can now utilize the new Salesforce integration user license, the API-only system integrations profile, and of course the relevant permission sets and permission set groups to grant that integration user access to your org and to data while still restricting that access exclusively to API operations. And finally, number one, don't create bespoke permission sets for individual users or bespoke profiles for that matter. Instead, you're going to want to use permission sets to describe jobs to be done and permission set groups for personas. And remember, you can mute permissions inside of a group to extend your existing permission sets even further. I hope you enjoyed this list of 10 things you should not do on Salesforce. This is of course not an exhaustive list. So if you enjoyed this type of content, be sure to follow me on social where I'll be adding even more things you should avoid doing as a Salesforce architect, admin, or developer. With that, I hope you have a wonderful day and I hope to see you back here at the Salesforce Architects YouTube channel very soon.